our job didn't end with construction. Engineers monitored the dam regularly, and over time, they realized the original dam would not withstand a probable maximum flood or a major earthquake. In 1984, the Secretary of the Interior approved modifications to Roosevelt Dam under Reclamation's Safety of Dams program. As if to illustrate the need for safety modifications, on January 19, 1993, three years prior to completion, record rainfall resulted in the lake flowing over the left abutment of the dam. Beginning early that day and continuing for nearly two days, up to 700 cubic feet per second of water crashed over the structure's wall. Spillway gates were opened February 12th and releases continued until March 8, 1993. The flooding resulted in $1 million in damage at the construction site and set the project back nearly six months. The modification, completed in April 1996, raised the height of the dam by 77 feet and increased storage capacity by over 1 million acre feet. High water flows that used to cause floods are now safely absorbed in the reservoir and released at a rate that won't exceed the capacity of the downstream dams. The extra water stored in the Roosevelt Dam Reservoir is used by residents and businesses in the metropolitan Phoenix area. The partnership between the Bureau of Reclamation and the Salt River Project goes back obviously a long way. We're proud of that partnership. I think one of the reasons why it's been so successful is we both understand our unique roles when it comes to the project. Over the years, we have really become to appreciate each other's role and respect each other's role. And uh, I think this dam and, and the age of this dam and the condition that it's in uh, of the whole project, not just this dam, really shows that the Salt River Project is a, is a quality organization, very professional and capable of, of maintaining this kind of facilities. And, and certainly the Valley of the Sun would not be what it is today if it wasn't for these kind of facilities being built by the federal government, partnership with Salt River Project, operated and maintained, and, and just that partnership of federal, local, is, is, is valuable to bring the kind of benefits that these projects produce. Meters. The crest length is 710 meters, 
The spillway length is 150 meters. The dam thickness at its foundation is 60 meters. At the crate, it is 10 meters. The type of rock that was used was fossil. The sand and aggravation was made in crush rock. The tail water dam height is 53 meters. The spillway height is 17 meters. <laughs> from the summit lands of the Rockies, the Colorado River responds to annual snowfalls with erratic flows. During the snowmelt period of April through July, it can roar through the canyons in a gigantic flood, or it can flow quietly and quickly fall back after the snow is gone. During each of the past 80 years or so, the Colorado has been measured and averages have been obtained. But the river cares not for averages and seems rather to follow its own mysterious destiny. In the fall of 1982 and the early spring of 1983, snow depths in the high mountains of Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah were only a little above average. In May, however, heavy snowstorms hit the high country. It was cold then, but the heat of summer cut like a hot knife and the heavy snow melt was on. First indication of flooding occurred just west of the Colorado River Basin along Utah's Wasatch Mountains. Here, the streams peaked quickly and filled Utah Lake to overflowing. The runoff cut through the city streets of Bountiful and Farmington, Utah. While in Salt Lake City, the water was channeled out onto some of the principal streets to form man-made rivers a fascinating diversion for office workers and tourists. In the Colorado River Basin itself, heavy flows came from mountains in five states. From Wyoming's lofty Wind River Mountains, the runoff rushed through Fontenelle Dam and onto Flaming Gorge Dam, where it overflowed the lake and plunged into the spillway and bypass tubes. In western Colorado, heavy releases from Blue Mesa Dam flowed into Morro Point Lake, which then spilled in a dramatic 350-foot drop. Crystal Reservoir also poured over its spillway in another dramatic freefall. And from the Uinta Mountains of Utah, flowed several streams and rivers. And all of these tributaries combined. From the Strawberry and the Duchesne, from the Green and the Big Sandy, from the Yampa, the White and the Eagle, from the Tomichi and the Gunnison, from the Dolores and the San Juan, from the Colorado. Every stream and every river poured into Lake Powell where the combined waters rose rapidly toward the spillways at Glen Canyon Dam. Efforts were made to control this unanticipated rise of Lake Powell by operating the power plant at full capacity, thus releasing 28,000 cubic feet per second of water. But it was not enough, as inflow into Lake Powell rose quickly to over 90,000 cubic feet per second in early June, and the left spillway gates had to be opened. It was understood that these spillways would probably suffer some erosion by a physical process called cavitation. 
cavitation occurs when high velocity flows are thrown upward by some small obstruction. This causes a partial vacuum, which produces vapor cavities in the water. These unstable cavities then collapse, sending intense shock waves against the concrete. At first, small pieces, then larger pieces of concrete are literally pounded out. After one hole has formed, a leapfrog action tends to promote the start of another, on down through the tunnel in stair-step fashion. It was realized, too, that most of the damage would probably occur at the elbow section, where the spillway levels out. After only four days' operation, inspectors found that cavitation had indeed been active at Glen Canyon. A photo taken by one of the inspectors disclosed holes in the concrete lining 20 feet wide and up to four feet deep. The spillways would have to be used, but the left one would carry most of the excess flow, thus preserving the right spillway for any future need. To reduce spillway use, wooden plywood flashboards four feet high were added to the spillway gates, and the outlet tubes were opened to bypass an additional 17,000 cubic feet per second of water. Although engineers had no way to see into operating spillways, they could tell what was happening by the action of the water emerging from the lower portal flip bucket. On June 19th, the left spillway stopped sweeping, indicating that erosion by cavitation was damaging the concrete tunnel lining. The flow was raised from 12,000 to 17,000 cubic feet per second, and the sweep resumed. But on June 28th, the sweeping again ceased. When the flow was raised, this time to 32,000 cubic feet per second, the increased flow brought forth sandstone-colored water. Pieces of concrete and rock were hurled from the spillway. Obviously, the spillway was being heavily damaged. The flow was immediately reduced and the water cleared. By this time, however, the peak of the spring runoff over 120,000 cubic feet per second was flowing into Lake Powell. Much of this inflow would have to be sent through the spillways. The automatic reservoir monitoring and control system, called RMAC for short, is a computerized control system for the monitoring and control of dam gates and reservoirs. Today, RMAC is successfully applied in numerous dams all over the world. The RMAC system measures the water level of a dam every 15 minutes. The system takes into consideration the geographical contours of each reservoir, the so-called area volume curves, as well as decades of historical river flow data and the outfall water levels. The real-time data are compared with the stored data and the current local requirements. This way, the optimum opening of the spillway gates is calculated. Rising and sinking water levels are measured by means of water level sensors installed in upstream and downstream positions. The RMAC software allows the exact monitoring and adjustment of the water flows to maintain specified water levels. Water level measurements are used by the system to calculate the inflows and outflows. The system then recalculates the combined opening of the gates to control the outflow of water as required by the project and commands the gates to open or close. 
The software helps to maintain the optimum reservoir level for the season by balancing the inflows and outflows. The PC-based system allows flexible programming and to change the response of the gates by changing the program. The RMAC system gives you a visual readout of the operational and the positional status of each gate at all times. Continuous data on water inflows into reservoir discharge calculations, gate positions and hydraulic system performance are stored by the system every 15 minutes and can be used for future analysis. The spillway gates are opened by retracting the cylinders. With cylinders fully closed, the gates are wide open. The outflow through the gate is controlled while measuring the inflow at the same time. Once the desired water levels are reached, if the inflows are reduced, the gates close through a reverse process. Several dams along the same river system can be perfectly synchronized by using RMAC. The established data can be transmitted in real time via OFC, PLCC, VSAT or GPRS. Montan Hydraulic is a complete systems provider for varied hydromechanical engineering packages for dams and weirs as well as sluices and bridges. Our portfolio of services and products includes detailed engineering of the complete system, cylinders for all types of hydraulic gates with application optimized piston rod coatings, position measurement systems, and integrated drive and control system. Hydraulic power units and control panels. Gate automation and RMAC. Turnkey delivery with installation and commissioning of the entire system on site. Montan Hydraulic, your best choice for customized solutions for hydromechanical engineering.